Area uh, Security Advisory Committee. And um, the first order of business is the approval of the August 14th meeting minutes. Madam Chair. Yes. Uh, uh, Chief Justice. Madam Chair, members of the committee, I have a number of amendments to the minutes. They're in the nature of technical amendments, adding statutory citations and things like that. And I wonder if it might be a better use of our time, given all the folks who are here today, if we maybe pull that item from the agenda, let me submit my technical corrections, and we can bring the minutes up for approval at a future meeting. That's, that's fine. I, uh, we can do that easily. I would also like to acknowledge that we have with us Commissioner Ramona Doman, who is uh, actually an, um, is a member of the advisory committee, but Assistant Commissioner Mark um, Danaski. Danaski, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> my mind isn't working so easily today. But uh, Mark Danaski has been sitting in for her, and uh, so it's a pleasure to have uh, the commissioner here. Uh, would you like to make any comments, Commissioner? Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, yes. Lieutenant Governor, I, I think we sat on a committee with, uh, with the governor, and we were never sure governor or Mr. Chair. So yes. good, good morning, and thank you. Um, and good morning to the members of the advisory committee. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Mona Doman, and I am pleased to serve as the Commissioner of Public Safety. And I'm actually pleased to be here today. I, um, I want to take a minute just to acknowledge the work of the very able Assistant Commissioner Mark Donaski. Um, it's good to be joining him at the table today, too. Um, but I want to thank him for his work um, on my behalf with the Minnesota State Patrol's Capital Security folks and with this advisory committee. He, as you well know, has been my eyes and my ears at these meetings, and he has also been my teacher and my advisor when it comes to security at this comple complex because if he brings um, good history and good knowledge having served as the Colonel of the Minnesota State Patrol for six years and has over 30 years in law enforcement. And Mark has been diligent in briefing me since the inception of this committee, and so I'd like to thank you, Mark. I'd also like to thank Major Meyerson and Captain Schroefer for the contributions that they have uh, made in helping this committee fulfill the work that you are required to do by statute. We really are here to be good listeners to the conversation and good stewards of the work we are directed to do by state statute. And that direction or that state statute will come as a result of the advice and recommendations that this committee will give to the governor and the legislature if you so decide. Our role also is to be available to you for consultation as you work to balance the openness of the Capitol building and Capitol complex area with the need for people to move about freely and hopefully without fear for their safety. We appreciate your support in advocating for the resources that we need to ensure um, the safety, not only of the complex itself, but the people who work here, the citizens who visit, and the process of government that takes place in these, inside these walls. I know that not all of these discussions will be easy, and as you work to formulate your recommendations, there will not always be simple solutions or answers to the questions that are asked. Your charge of taking a broad and overarching examination of security on the Capitol complex and melding it with the wants and the needs and desires and expectations of the executive, judicial, and legislative branches of government and the public to formulate your strategic plan to move forward is not an easy task. I and we look forward to the conversations and the discussion as you continue this good work. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, is there anybody that wishes to make any statements at this time. Um, I think at this time we would like to continue our discussion about the policy of firearms in the Capitol. And um, I don't know if there's anybody that has anything that they want to add at this time, but I made a few notes and if I can find them here. And uh, realized that we didn't have answers to a lot of things regarding the use of firearms in the Capitol. And, and um, one of them is that, you know, what are our expectations if there are concealed carry holders in the, in the Capitol? What are our expectations of uh, those that are con carrying concealed weapons in the, in the case of an incident? And, 
and what can we expect, if anything? And I, I don't know um, if there's statute that governs that or um, or, or if, anybody, if there's any discussion about what would be the purpose for it. Say there's an incident in the Capitol, somebody's under threat, what would happen? Madam Chair? Yes. Madam Chair, I don't have... Representative Pamer. Madam Chair, I don't have an answer. I have just uh, a couple of things, just thoughts. Uh, first of all, I'm wondering if the commissioner is going to be available for questions um, since she is the commissioner of public safety uh, today or if we should direct questions to her. Um, I guess that would be my first comment, um, first question then. And then um, I really do think we should address this issue of expectations of, um, of both uh, pe of people who are carrying uh, firearms. I guess I would, have a I would have a question of the commissioner in asking about her professional judgment regarding that very question that you just asked, and I'd like to rephrase it. Okay, you, you certainly can take the lead on this, and, you, and we certainly can have conversations with members of our committee. Okay, can I, should I address the question that you raised first, or can I ask another question first? You can do whichever you please. <laughs> well, I guess, uh, I guess, Madam Chair, I just, just since we have the commissioner here, I, I, I would like to know what her official policy is on the current procedure for concealed carry permit owners to um, email you and let them know that they are um, potentially bringing a firearm to the Capitol. As we discussed last week, uh, it appears that there is no validation um, whether that person who has emailed you uh, actually has a permit or not. So um, I guess I'm asking what, whether you support the current policy, if you have any ideas for, for changes, and um, I'd like you to respond. Madam Chair. Yes, Commissioner. Representative Paymar and members. The current policy, actually the current state law requires a permit carrier to notify the Commissioner of Public Safety if they intend to carry while at the Capitol. And that is, that is pretty much what the statute says. And so they can notify in, by really any means. It's not specific in statute as to the means in which they would notify the commissioner. So it could be by email. It could be by a letter mailed to the office. It potentially could be by a phone call. Um, I can tell you that over the past year, actually over the past two and a half years, most of the notifications to me are uh, via electronic mail. The statute does not provide the authority for me or anyone in my office to be able to verify whether or not the, in, the individual notifying um, is a valid permit holder or not. Madam Chair. It's Representative Paymar. And is it, uh, Commissioner, is it your professional opinion that the legislature, is this something that you would ask this committee to examine? Do you think we should examine it uh, as sort of the top cop here at the Capitol Complex? Um, should we be examining that statute to determine whether we should grant you the authority to validate whether somebody has a, uh, a valid permit? Madam Chair, Representative. Yes, Representative Paymar and members. I think that is a discussion that this committee should, should have to really examine the statute because your charge really is balancing the safety of people here at the Capitol and constitutional rights of those who are legally carrying. And so we would be, um, I guess I would say that we have had these discussions in my office since I came. I think that there are people who are under the assumption that we have the authority to, to make that verification, and so we would be um, interested in having those discussions. Yeah. And, and Madam Chair, I don't belabor, belabor this too, too much, but uh, I just want to make sure we're clear, because from what my understanding from our last discussion that uh, once somebody 
uh, sends an email to you informing them that they, informing you that they will be bringing a firearm to the Capitol. They don't need to do that every time they bring a firearm at the Capitol. So do you know how many people, if any, do you know, have people, yeah, I, I, so is that, is that problematic to you, A, and B, do we know how many, if there's anybody here today who's informed you that they're, they're bringing a firearm to the Capitol today? Madam Chair, Commissioner. Representative Paymar, members, the statute does not address how often or how many times an individual has to notify the commissioner. It's, it specifically says that an individual, if they intend to carry at the Capitol, has to notify the commissioner. Our interpretation, my legal advice has been that if they notify the commissioner once, they have notified the commissioner and they have met their obligation per statute. Uh, permits to carry are valid for five years. And so I think that um, the, it would be interesting discussion for this committee to have as to whether or not that notification has an expiration date based on the knowledge of, of uh, how often permits expire. Okay. On that issue, I'm, I, on that issue I'm, I'm done. I'm, I'm, I'm pleased. Uh, Madam Chair, Commissioner, that you do think that's an issue that the committee should discuss. Um, and hopefully act on. Did you also want to address the other issue about? Well, I, I can. I mean, I don't, I don't want to be uh, dominating the, the conversation here if someone else has. Uh, yes, and <laughs> I'd also at this time like to acknowledge we do have a new member of the committee, Senator Engelbretson. It, Senator Engelbretson, did thank you, you have Thank you very comment? much, uh, Madam Chair, and, and uh, what a wonderful opportunity for me to work with you again, uh, as we did uh, previously when I came into the uh, Senate in 2007. The question I would have is, uh, uh, Commissioner, uh, with, with the statute that's in place now, how many violations have you had of that statute over the last five, six years? Is there any record of that? Anybody coming into the, the Capitol that you know of that has been arrested for carrying a, without a permit? Madam Chair, I am going to turn over to Captain, I did the same thing that you did at the last meeting, to Major Meyerson. I'm going to turn it over to Major Meyerson because he has been at the Capitol far longer than I have and would probably have a better handle on that. Major Meyerson. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator, members, um, I've been assigned to the Capitol for the last seven and a half to eight years and in that time we have not had a violation and we don't keep specific numbers on the number of uh, individuals we've confronted and checked. But in that time, we have not, to my knowledge, and I believe I would know have had a violation of the, uh, the law hearing on the Capitol. Madam Chair. Madam Chair. Commissioner. I, <coughs> Commissioner, how, just a minute. Commissioner, if you can't, if you can't ask anybody, how do you know? Senator Rest, Commissioner is speaking. Commissioner. I'm sorry, Madam Chair. I, I just realized I didn't answer one of your questions, Representative Paymar, and that's how many people notified me about carrying today. And I, can, I just wanted to clarify, I did get three notifications in the last 20, probably five notifications in the last 24 hours that there would be people, some, that an individual might be here and might be carrying. Senator Rest. If you can't ask anybody, how do you know whether they have a, a valid permit or not? I mean, how do you know? Major. Madam Chair, Senator, we do, uh, when we see someone with a firearm, we do engage them in, in conversation and inquire with them if they are carrying and then make inquiry if they have a valid permit to carry, if they're carrying it with them, and then uh, compare that with the list that we keep. And how do you know that the Permit, Madam Chair, how do you know that the permit is valid? Madam Chair, Senator, members, we, uh, we determine that by they are required to carry the permit with them, and we can check that through the computer systems. And the, Madam Chair, Major Meyerson, and the law allows you to do that. Is that correct? That's correct. We need articulable suspicions to engage someone. I mean, we can't just stop everyone at this point 
uh, that comes into the building or that we have to have reason to stop and uh, to ask someone for that information. Madam Chair, and is the fact that someone is carrying a weapon um, reason enough to ask them if they have a permit? I believe so. We have used that uh, standard since I've been here, yes. Madam Chair, Major Meyerson, how many times have you done that in the last two years? Senator, I can't say specifically. I don't know. During this last session when we had... Three times? Four times? A dozen uh, times? I would suspect a couple dozen times perhaps during the last year. And when I say me, I mean we, I understand. our staff, yes. Okay, thank you. Well, um, any further discussion? As I reflect on this, I think that some things that we might want to consider is um, would it be appropriate that when somebody, rather than just email, that they have a permit and they may carry at the Capitol, that people have to submit their permit at the time that they, so that we verify that they have a permit? And the other thing is that permits expire, I believe, every two years. So, years. and or they may be revoked. Is it five years? Every five years. But it seems reasonable that, does it not, that people would have to um, resubmit when their permit is renewed? And how do we follow up if a permit has been revoked? What if somebody's had a DWI or or some kind of an incident that that would not allow them to carry a gun. How, do, how would we know that? Because at this time, people um, just notify the commissioner that they have a permit, they may carry a gun in the Capitol, and that is on the list into perpetuity without ever having to be revisited. But I'm, I'm, I'm not asking you to make a decision. I'm just raising some issues, saying, are, are there some other, how do we verify that people that say they have a permit have a permit? And the other thing is, would it be appropriate that if people are going to be carrying in the Capitol, that they notify, just pick up the phone or send an email saying, I intend to have a gun in the Capitol today, so that if, if Major Meyerson or, or, um, or uh, Captain Schrofer knows that somebody has a gun in the, in the Capitol, they then would be able to, um, to know who is entitled to have guns in the Capitol and who is not entitled to have guns in the Capitol. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm still trying Senator. to figure, um, follow the process. So. Uh, Major Meyerson, if, if you uh, see someone that you would like to ask whether they have a permit for the weapon that they're carrying, you look at the, you look at the permit um, and determine that it's valid. And then the next step is to um, call the commissioner's office and make sure that they have uh, done the proper notification or uh, Separate from um, assuming that the permit they're, they're count, that they're car carrying is uh, legitimate. Madam Chair, Thank Senator, you. and members, uh, the process, and I'll just step back. Uh, when the commissioner's office is notified uh, that someone intends to carry, uh, they send to us that notification uh, immediately through an email, and subsequently, if it's uh, a hard copy, they'll send that uh, to us, forward that to us. So immediately we put that on a list and uh, it's maintained uh, readily accessible in our dispatch uh, in the Capital Security Office. So the two pieces to the law that we validate first and foremost is we want to ensure that they have a legal permit to carry. And once we've determined that, then we look at the second piece and compare their name against the list that we maintain in Capital Security. Okay. Senator Ingebrigtsen. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and Major, can you tell me how many permits now are, are recorded in your office? And maybe you could comment on what, 
what the chair talked about, the ex expiration after five years, uh, is it reasonable to expect that they recall, re reinstate their permission to carry or their notification, I should say, to carry? I guess I ask that because if, if you have a high number of people that have said they're going to carry, how do you know, how do you know if, uh, if they're expired after five years, do you get notification of that, or I know I know you can certainly be notified by a Clio if if there's a felon that that revokes it. But how do you know they just don't move on? I mean, for you to, to try and plan for say eight nine hundred people when there's really only six hundred, I guess I'm a little confused with that. Major, Madam Chair, Senator, and members. Um, as of last week, we had 832, and I was trying to get the uh, email and trying to get the current number. I think that we've received a couple more since last week. And uh, we don't know uh, of those how many are currently carrying um, or have a permit to carry. And we don't know if the day after someone submits a notification uh, that they were revoked their, um, it, we don't know what their status is uh, thereafter. And uh, at times, I think there's a certain percentage of the individuals who have notified the commissioner. Um, they will do it multiple times, and we track how many times they've actually notified the commissioner. So there are some who have notified once originally when the law was first uh, enacted, and others have uh, notified uh, pretty close to annually, if not when they renew their uh, permit to carry. Madam Chair. Commissioner. Uh, and Madam Chair and members, just for sort of full disclosure or fairness to the discussion, a good majority of the people since I became commissioner, when they notify that they're going to be at the Capitol and carry, do provide either a copy of their permit and or a copy of their driver's license. I think with the intent that we can cross-reference and that they won't run into problems when they're at the Capitol. Uh, that's not an obligation by statute, but there are some that have done that. So how reasonable would it be for chairs or the Speaker of the House or Majority Leader when there are very volatile decisions being made within the chambers or committee meetings to have some right to say, I don't want to allow guns in, in the room at the time? Should there, should there be any opportunity for somebody to say to to eliminate guns from a certain area at certain periods of time should I look, I'm just raising issues but I, I think there are lots of ways in the middle to deal with this issue and still allow people to be to be um, to have their guns should I know lots of people feel uncomfortable walking to the Capitol without their guns. They feel like they need to protect themselves. But should there be a spot at the entrance, either where they, they say, look, I'm carrying a gun today, or where they put it in a, in a vault or a Lockbox. locker of some sort? Um, and we haven't talked yet about the issue of what's the responsibility of the person who is carrying a gun in an incident. Madam Chair. Representative Payman. I'd like to hear the commission. Can we ask the commissioner to respond to this? Commissioner, do you have any thoughts on that? And the question is whether or not. What actually can a person carrying a gun who is legally um, licensed or permitted to carry a gun, what can they do in an incident? then maybe doesn't involve them, probably doesn't involve them. Madam Chair, Representative Paymar, members, as law enforcement officers, we're trained to go to the threat and to eliminate the threat or to take control of the situation. And we're repeatedly trained in that manner in order to neutralize the situation. And so under the deadly force statutes, we 
have the authority to neutralize that situation if our life is in danger or the life of someone else is in danger. Certainly the permit carry holders, permit to carry holders have gone through significant training to be certified or to obtain the permit, but they're trained in a different manner from what a law enforcement officer is trained, not necessarily trained to go to the threat or to neutralize the threat, unless of course they're a permit, hold, hold, permit holder that has law enforcement training. I'm sure. Yes, Representative. M Madam Chair, Commissioner, I appreciate that because I was going to ask you um, because I believe you were a police chief. I can't remember which city you were police chief, but it doesn't, I guess it doesn't matter. But so uh, um, if you're comfortable um, differentiating uh, in, in, in a little more detail about the, the training because the chair brought up the issue of expectations of permit holders and um, um, their representative from, um, from a gun group last week said that uh, basically, if I can paraphrase, that uh, the legislature and staff and, and the members of the public are actually safer by the very fact that they have their firearms, I'm not sure who's carrying today, but that they have their firearms with them. And I hate to bring Representative Woodard up here when he's not here, but he said on tape at the last hearing that uh, having permit holders uh, armed at the Capitol actually decreases threats. Um, so in light of what you've just said, um, I guess I would ask you, um, given the the difference in training, as I understand it, uh, uh, licensed peace officers get uh, uh, use of force continuum training once a year, um, depending on the, on the department. I'm not sure how much you get on deadly force. As I understand, the permit holder has an eight-hour class that they go to that deals with a number of things, how to use a weapon, safety, et cetera, et cetera, firing, um, and that's it for five years. So I guess the first, that first question is to follow up on, um, on uh, your professional opinion about what should, what should um, not, maybe not the responsibility, but what should we expect of, a, of someone who has a permit if there were an incident? Let me just use this as an example. Um, I mean, s suppose somebody, you have a licensed, there's a licensed I, th I saw a trooper in here with a firearm, I believe, but, and I don't know how many people are carrying here, but what if somebody were to get up in this hearing room and posed, an Im posed what might be perceived as an imminent threat to a member speaking to this, testifying before this hearing, or to any person <coughs> sitting at this table? Would, would you, do you consider the, would you advise the permit holder who's carrying today to fire on that individual? Madam Chair. Commissioner. Representative Paymar and members, I'm gonna to try to answer that question two ways. The training that a permit holder gets to obtain the permit is significantly different than the training that a law enforcement officer gets throughout the course of their year, the course of their career. As sworn peace officers, we are obligated to respond if there is, an, if there is um, threat to our lives, to the lives of others in, our, in the area. So if someone were to become a threat with a firearm in this room today, for sure we have four police officers sitting at the table who would respond by obligation because of what we've sworn to do. Permit, carry, or permit holders are not obligated by statute to respond to imminent threats. Commissioner, are they even allowed if they are not under threat? Go ahead and answer that, Bob, on the permit holder on self-defense. Major Myers. Major. Chair and members, uh, under the law, uh, law enforcement has an obligation to advance on a threat and under the law the permit holders are uh, obligated to protect themselves or retreat. Madam Chair? Yes. If I can clarify the law, if I can clarify the law that um, 
If someone posed an imminent threat to me, um, I could, under the, under the statute on justifiable, justifiably taking one's life, I could, I could use my firearm to protect myself. But, it all, but the statute also says that, um, uh, that uh, I'll just read it. The intentional taking of the life of another is not authorized under uh, section 609.06 except when necessary in resisting or preventing an offense which the actor reasonably believes exposes the actor or another person uh, to great bodily harm or death or preventing, the com or preventing the commission of a felony in the actor's place of abode. The way I interpret that statute, that means that a person who is caring in this audience uh, could use their firearm and kill um, somebody who posed an imminent threat to another person. Am I mistaken on that? Major. Uh, Madam Chair and Representative and members, I believe that that uh, is in regards to the person's place or abode and outside of their place of abode there's a different standard for what their responsibility is and how to respond. So Madam Chair, so it's only in the household that that, that, that statute? That is my understanding and I'm not a permit holder. I carry a firearm under a peace officer status and know what my obligation is. Purely well, Madam Chair, that. if that's the case, then I, I'm, I guess what I'm wondering is like Representative Woodard and the representative from this organization and, uh, and I ac actually you know, appreciate the, uh, the humor. I, there's a picture of you and I in this cartoon that's, uh, that went out from the Star Tribune, and this is by the gun owners group, and, and it's, it has a picture of you saying to me, now look here, Paymar, let me see if I can spell this out for you. It's not the legal permit holders that are the problem. So it's kind of an amusing one. You, you can stick it up on your office. <laughs> but I mean, the, the, the inference here is, is that we are all safer because they are carrying. And, and now we're getting applause. So um, I guess I'm trying to figure out, are we, if, if now you're saying that the statute does not um, go beyond the abode, and I, maybe we need a legal interpretation of that, but if someone brought a firearm in here and threatened one of us, the assumption is, is that some people out here could kill this person and not, and, and. Does anybody know if our um, legal Council is here from the Attorney General's office. They just come on an as kind of requested basis, so not today. Madam Chair, I guess, guess, I, I guess what I'm trying to get at here, and, I, and maybe this is just something we need more information on, is that you started the meeting with this idea about what is the expectation of, of us or permit holders to use their firearm. They, they have their firearm for self-protection, uh, and uh, whether they're... Um, walking to the building or in the building. Um, so if that's the intent, but then does it expand, does it extend to other people who might be in imminent fear or who think they might be? And so they keep saying that, you know, the place is safer because they have firearms. Uh, Representative Woodard says that, and I've certainly heard that. I mean, that seems to be the argument. So if that's the case, we need to, I think we need to know what they can do or can't do. I agree, and we'll, we should do more research on that. Senator, did you want to add to that? No, thank you. Madam Chair, and, and to his representative's comments, uh, you know, we, we come up with hypotheticals, and, and let me put this one out there, and I guess we can only wonder what would have been the outcome should somebody in the theater in Aurora, Colorado had a permit to carry. When the shooting started at the... Um, it's not, it's, not, it's not very sensitive to call it what I'd like to call it, but nevertheless, an awful lot of people were being shot uh, just at random. I don't think for any individual purpose other than we had a person that was crazed and was going to kill people that day. If there had been somebody there within a couple of rows that actually would have drawn their personal protection weapon and stopped that threat, maybe we would have had half the deaths to have to mourn. You can put those hypotheticals out there all day long. The point that I made earlier, Representative, was that 
nothing seems to have been broken here in, in, in the capital complex or the property. There has never been any incidents to worry about. Personal Protection Act is exactly what it is. You can protect yourself. And as the commissioner has said very eloquently, cops do run to the threat, but nobody else is required to do that. But if somebody points a gun at you, Representative, and you had a, a form to, to protect yourself, I think you would. I just really do. I think it would be a natural instinct. Uh, and maybe not. I don't know that. Um, but so we could run hypotheticals all day, what ifs. And I, I often wonder if somebody in the front row of that theater could have stopped that threat. I guess I could go to Sandy Hook and say the same thing, too. Now we're talking teachers with guns. I don't want to go there, but nevertheless, maybe, you know, 10 of those parents would have been going home that night mourning the deaths of their, of their babies instead of 20. So there's always that if on the other side, too. Law-abiding citizens have a right to protect themselves, and there has not been anything broken here that, I, that I'm at least being aware of by, by the people that protect us here, so. Madam Chair. Representative. Uh, Commissioner, or maybe Senator Engelbert, senior law enforcement officer, do you know, do, do, any, do, uh, do we have any uh, research that um, says that concealed permit carrier owners don't commit crimes? Do you know if, if any permit holders have committed crimes since we, since we enacted the Personal Protection Act? Senator. Madam Chair, I think that's a very good question. Uh, I, I can only give you my experience as the elected sheriff for 16 years. I issued hundreds of permits to carry, and I, not had, I didn't have one of those people commit a crime, at no. least not reported to me with, with that particular protection. Madam Not Chair, one. but I'm sure there might. I'm sure there has been someone. I think the BCA might have record of that. Madam Chair, I, I'd like to get that information. Also, I, my data from the BCA says that since 2003, uh, over 1,455 concealed carry permit owners have committed crimes, including three homicides, 39 terroristic threats, 71 restraining order violations, 141 domestic assaults. I could go on. So I think that you know we can say we can say that everybody is law-abiding. We wished everybody was, but the fact of the matter: some permit carry holders do commit crimes. And I would ask you this, Senator Brits, uh, Ingebrigtsen, as a professional law enforcement officer, um, would it be your advice? Um, I, you you brought up the movie theater situation. This this very hearing room is, um, you know, we could compare that. I guess. Um, but as an officer, and I guess the commissioner seemed to answer this question about the training that you get, you wouldn't just pull out a firearm and shoot somebody if they, um, I mean, that would not be your first choice even as a law enforcement officer, especially in a room like this or in a movie theater when you could conceivably uh, in high emotion, shoot a lot of innocent people. I mean, that would not be your first choice as a law enforcement officer, would it? No, 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 it wouldn't, and, and, Madam Chair. Yes. Uh, I have been in that situation, not the theater situation, but I have had been in a situation where I was able to talk the person out of the gun, give them the chance. I don't think there's any, not too many officers in the Midwest that don't have that same opportunity can probably tell that same story with a 35-year career. Obviously, I was quite successful because I'm here talking about it, but I also didn't ever have to fire my weapon, but if the chance were there, uh, I would have had to do that. It's as simple as, as simple as that. Now, my partner wasn't so lucky. My partner was actually murdered in 1978 by somebody who was actually in court with four handguns in his possession, came off the street. And that certainly got a, a lot of dialogue going about courtroom security, which I think we've come a long ways with regards to counties and cities that have courtrooms where they have they shouldn't be allowing weapons in there. Those are very high emotions, as the chair talks about. Those are real high emotions. And, and, uh, but the people's place where they do business, uh, uh, we do have high emotion cases here. We have had, that's my point, we have had very many emotional cases here. And uh, I, I've yet, in the seven years that I've been here, the major's been here seven and a half years, and never had, an, I, I don't recall an incident of anybody threatening anybody even with a gun. Um, I might be wrong. Madam Chair. I might also add, with your statistics, how many of those statistics that the BCA has reported where they actually used that gun to commit the crime? I don't think that's a very high statistic. Madam Chair. Yes, Representative. I don't, I don't have all. You, I, I think we should get that information from the BCA. But I'm glad you clarified the fact that 
we deal with high uh, emotional, contentious issues here at the Capitol, uh, just like courthouses do. I'm glad you brought that point up. But I, I just, you know, maybe we can get beyond the discussion, but I would like to just close this piece by saying that I think I would like us to dispel, given your testimony, Senator, and the Commissioner's testimony, that these folks here who are carrying firearms, I don't want them protecting me. I don't need them protecting me. I would, I would rather have a uniformed officer protecting me that someone who, that some, rather than someone who went to an eight-hour class once in five years protecting me. Now, if they want to protect themselves, that's fine. But I don't want people standing up here and firing their firearms at anyone. And, and so if, that's, if, if the issue here is, is that they're here as sort of a quasi-posse here for law enforcement, then let's get that on the table. If not, then let's, let's put that on the table. Madam Chair, Madam Chair, actually I did preside over a posse uh, for years and, and, and uh, this is the history I have with guns. At one time the, uh, the posse wore the same uniform as the licensed officer. And it was my opinion that if you're going to put an, an, op an officer out there in a, in, a, uh, in a uniform, they should be wearing a gun because when, quite frankly, the, uh, the bad guy pulls a gun out to supposedly stop a threat, who are they going to shoot at? They're going to shoot at the uniform. They don't shoot at the person, they shoot at the uniform. So I'm a, I'm a little indifferent when it comes to posses, but I don't think there's a hired posse here. Maybe there is. Uh, I'm not paying them, but I'm glad you pointed out that they're not here to protect you. They're here to protect themselves if they're carrying a weapon, and that's all that they that's all they want to do. That's all they're required to do is and under the Second Second Amendment and Minnesota statute to protect themselves. They're not here to protect you and I. Thank you. Madam Chair. Uh, we will get the report from the Bureau uh, on the statistics, and that report will come as a result of the obligation that law enforcement has to report to the BCA on, on the number of crimes committed. So we'll make sure that we get that to the Thank committee. You. Now, last week we also talked about um, finding out what they're doing in other sta uh, states in their capitals. It, is that report available yet, or is that in the process? Madam Chair. Um, Captain. Members, we do have uh, a draft copy of some information that we've compiled from other states. It's not complete yet, okay. so before releasing it, I'd like to gather some uh, additional data from some states that we don't have information for. Okay. Um, but what I can tell you is we are in a minority. The state of Minnesota, the Capitol Complex, is in a minority of um, the access that we allow at the Capitol, um, as well as screening processes. But when I get the data completely, I will release uh, the information to you. Okay, thank you. Is there anything that anybody would like to add to this conversation at this time? Or any other issues that people would like to raise at this time? Well, it doesn't feel like a finished conversation, that's for sure. Um, well, Madam Chair, I, you know, I... Representative. Well, it's really this, you know, I... I it, it is sort of discouraging that in the, you know, we have a whole room of people here who, advisors and people, and, and we're we're not coming up with any recommendations. We're not coming. It's like we have been silenced in some way, and I don't know what that's about. <clears throat> and you know, we're here to look at the public safety of the Capitol complex, and and I and I, I I would hope that the department would be able to, and not in their analysis, um, Captain, just to say that we're in the minority. We know we're in the minority. There's. I have an exact, I don't have the exact number, but it was, I thought I said 13 states last week. I'm not sure if that's accurate or if it's seven, we're one of seven states or wh whatever the exact, the right quote is that allow firearms in their capital. Um, and, uh, but it seems to me that, you know, that there has to be other, you know, policies or procedures that other capitals use that could be helpful to us if, you know, it doesn't sound like we're going down the road to banning guns in the Capitol complex. Now, I personally feel that we should. Um, but uh, short of that, and I think that, I think that the chair was trying to, 
to um, elicit that kind of discussion. Short of that is, are there some compromise solutions that the department could recommend to us um, that we could then um, recommend to the legislature for possible action? I mean, I think at the very least, that's, that's what, what, our, what our expectation should be. And I don't hear anything coming from anybody. OK. And Maybe that can be given some thought, and um, we will be having f future meetings about this issue. Madam um, Chair, can I ask another, one more question, and then I don't know if you're going to get the testimony Certainly. here, but you know, given, uh, given the fact that um, we are remodeling this building, that we are uh, in the process of constructing a Senate building, are there any, are there any considerations or recommendations? Uh, we've had some discussions about some of the uh, uh, the risks of this building just by all of the di various entry points, et cetera. I mean, is there any thought about making any recommendations about future use if a governor and legislature at some point did want to ban guns from the Capitol complex on using um, on a, a, a more uh, easily um, positioned metal detector in either of those buildings? I mean, are these things that, I mean, it seems to me this is the, pro this is the time to be discussing that since we're in the process. If there, is there any uh, construction modifications that would need to take place? I know we have, I know Chris, we have some of those uh, detectors in the basement that we haven't used, but. Yeah, Chris Gevin. Madam Chair, that. Representative, uh, absolutely, as part of the design process, there is a security element of that process where we bring in the experts in security and uh, allow them to voice their concerns and we implement those design amenities that would allow for scalability for metal detection and things of that nature. The uh, detectors themselves would not necessarily be part of the design or some of the other elements that we have in design or will have in design. However, there will be allowances put in the design that would allow that in the future if indeed the Commissioner of Public Safety would warrant something like that, or if there was an event that would uh, warrant uh, an increase in security in the facility. So the newer facility and this facility as it is, renovated, restored, will have those options placed in it. Senator. Thank you, ma'am. Madam Chair, and I hate to belabor this, but Representative Paymar talked about fixing something that, that, again, has not proven to be broken here. That's what we do in the legislature. A lot of times we, at least the seven years that I've been here, we come together when there's problems and tweak things. We, we fix different statutes because, because our, our citizens are, are uh, endangered. And you, you for sure, are, you know, public safety chair know all about that. You hear all, the, you hear all the different fixes that we come up with and that are legitimate, and there is a good reason why we do come together, but there is that I see of no reason whatsoever. Uh, and I think uh, recently, and you talked about governor and a new legislature, I think Governor Dayton even made the comment that uh, everything seems to be just fine. Uh, I might be, I don't want to quote the governor here, but I think he seemed to think it was, the policy that was in place was just fine. Uh, I happen to agree with that, and, and I, I think that should be considered. Uh, but again, that's why we come together as a legislature, is to fix something when it's broke. And it uh, doesn't appear that anything is broken, at least to the testimony today, well, unless we're going to hear something else from the testifiers, Madam Chair. Well, and on, and on the other hand, perhaps we haven't had an incident, but that doesn't mean that there aren't problems, because I certainly have heard my share of staff that are very afraid when they know that there are, that the member that they're representing is carrying a controversial issue and at, and there are times when they feel fear for their life. Um, whether it's warranted or not warranted, I don't know. But they, there isn't always a sense of safety here in the Capitol. I, I know when parents have brought children in from other states, they're, they're very concerned that there's n no security at the door. They wonder, they don't see that in other states, well, how that can be. And, and with all the kids that are going in and out and all the um, people that are going out in and out. How do you maintain safety and security in the capital? 
So not everybody has the same orientation or the same mindset about what constitutes safety. Um, and I do think that that means we still need to have the discussion about it. Mm -hmm. And maybe we need to hear from some of those people who don't feel safe, but they're the ones that are afraid to come and testify no, too. Yeah. Yes. So maybe this would be a good time um, for us to take testimony. Now, I want, I want to make it really clear that we are not asking for you to, um, we're not looking for opposition or support. We're not looking for you to lobby for a position. We're looking for advisement. We're looking for you to, to um, give us, because we're not, we have no uh, legislation that we're proposing at this time. We're just asking for your input. So what we want to know from you, what are we overlooking? What should we be addressing that maybe isn't being addressed? Um, and we have 27 testifiers. I'd really like to give everybody a chance to speak, but that only allows about one minute per person to come up, state your position, and leave. Do you think that's a possibility? I, I would like to hear from everybody. So why don't we try to start with that and, and ask you, come up. Madam Chair. Please don't repeat what others are saying. Madam Chair. Can I, just, can I just say, I mean, I, it, it, you, you are chairing the meeting, and uh, uh, when I held hearings, um, I, I had that, I allowed a lot of testimony, uh, <laughs> and I, it was helpful, and I'm glad people got a chance to speak, but uh, um, uh, you, you know, you've already sent out instructions that you were allowing 15 minutes for, for proponents of, of, a, of a changed policy and 15 minutes for those who think the policy is, 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 is fine just as it is. And some of those folks have tailored their comments to fit within that 15 minute parameter. And to now say that they have one minute, I think is not very helpful for, for that. Okay. And, and so if you, you I'm know, just I, not I guess sure I, how we decide who's on what side of what issue. Well, Madam and Chair, and if we can, I, can assume that those who have, are wearing maroon want to keep the policy <laughs> the way it is, and Ma anybody who's not wearing maroon Ma wants Ma to Chair, change it. I just suggest a, I just uh, you can do what you want, but you could you could have 15 minutes for proponents, 15 minutes for opponents, and then if you wanted to open it up for further discussion, I I'm fine with listening as long as people want to. Okay, that we. Uh, I'll agree to that, but let's try to keep your comments as focused as possible and on recommendations to the to the committee. And because I don't know who's on what side here, I'm going to call on Linda Windsor and then anybody who supports her position would have 15 minutes to testify. So, um, hello, I'm Linda Windsor. May I clarify then, are we taking the people who are, I, I am opposing firearms in the Capitol, does That's that mean fine. that our people would be in line and then we'd do the other 15? So yes. people need to be ready. Okay. Thank you very much for this opportunity. My name is Linda Windsor. I'm from St. Paul. Madam Chair, members of the committee, lawmakers must seek a balance in freedom and citizens of Minnesota should have the freedom to go to the Capitol feeling safe and free and of, of intimidation. I oppose having firearms in our capital because I know that more guns do not make us safer and in fact make it less safe for Minnesotans to freely participate in democracy. I attended nearly all of the legislative hearings regarding common sense gun laws for Minnesota earlier this year and was shocked to learn that firearms are allowed in our capital. I attended the hearings in order to support common sense gun laws and found myself surrounded by armed folks who passionately opposed any new legislation. The first hearing day I was interviewed by a Pioneer Press reporter Two days, later, uh, the two days later, I showed up on the front page in an article, and I, as I showed it to my adult son over breakfast, as I prepared to head back down to the Capitol for another hearing, my son advised me not to go since my photo was in the paper and it might not be safe with armed folks who disagree with me. That was a sad day for me. As I explained to my son that it was important for me to have my voice heard and participate in democracy at my Capitol. In the ensuing days at the Capitol, I watched and listened as intimidating and demeaning comments were aimed at me and others who shared my values. Family members and friends were concerned and many were unwilling to come to the Capitol knowing that people loaded with loaded firearms were pre present. 
The argument that permit holders make people safer has not been borne out by research. Furthermore, nothing in Minnesota law prohibits people with violent, anti-government feelings or dangerously mentally ill people who haven't been committed from being concealed carried permit holders. Fa um, this is because state law tied law enforcement's hands to deny permit holders to people who they believe should not have them. I'm here today to encourage you to be proactive in protecting the public and legislators in our capital. It is your duty to do your best to prevent gun violence rather than wait until someone is injured or killed. The U.S. Capitol bans firearms and so does the vast majority of state capitals. Will you wait for something bad to happen for, before doing your best? Public safety in our capital rests in your hands. Thank you very much. Thank you. you. It's okay if you speak from right there. And if others would like to come up and fill the chairs, please do so. Go ahead. Give us your name, please. Thank you. My name is Anna Dick Gambucci, and I'm from St. Paul. I attended most of the House, Minnesota House and Senate Public Safety Committee hearings this past February. I initiated conversations with many influential people on both sides of the debate and organized a high-profile St. Paul community dialogue on gun violence prevention. I'm not a fearful person, nor am I narrow-minded. I was a testifier in a House committee hearing on February 7th. After uncomfortably sitting in the minority for two days in the upstairs overflow room, witnessing a growing disregard for civility and respect for the democratic process, I started to feel deeply intimidated. Many angry citizens who'd come to protect their gun rights were also carrying loaded weapons and were acting as if they were completely above the law. In order to get out of that intimidation and Wild West mentality of that overflow room, for me to regain the sense of safety I needed to continue participation in the hearings, I had to be willing to testify so that I could be granted admission into the supervised hearing room, and in so doing, set myself up to possibly be targeted later since I was testifying in opposition to NRA and Gokra's position. As I left shortly after my testimony, someone in the room quietly heckled me for leaving early at 9 o'clock p.m., and this was the supervised room. I found someone to escort me to my car that night, as I did after every public safety hearing session. All it would take is one loose cannon following me directly out of the Capitol to my car, armed. In addition to intimidation and guns at the Capitol influencing me in my role as a listener and a testifier, it also influenced my ability to bring my kids to be part of the hearing process, to allow my family to stand in solidarity, to say, stop this madness, stop this escalation of shootings and unreasonable gun access. But there was no way that those overflow rooms felt emotionally or physically safe enough to bring my children. Well, children not wearing NRA caps. Intimidation and guns played a central role in limiting participation for some, maybe for many, in this supposedly democratic debate. The final effects of guns at the Capitol I'll mention today is that I reluctantly chose not to bring my seven and 10 year olds to the Capitol Rotunda on President's Day for a rally for freedom from gun violence because I didn't know what kind of intimidation to expect. The goal was for families and community to gather in solidarity and peace. Few children attended. I had already brought my kids to one risky community meeting. A parent should only be asked to risk so much. A citizen should only be asked to risk so much. Please stop this erosion of our democratic process. Please ban civil, civilian guns inside our state capitol and its meeting rooms. Thank you. Thank you. Sir? Hello, my name is Sammy Rachamim. Thank you. To me, the Capitol is a place for a free-flowing exchange of opinions and ideas, not bullets. When I came to testify on behalf of our still dire need for comprehensive background checks, I was shocked at the sight of dozens of guns on people's bodies with no uniform on. It was intimidating, and citizens like myself and John Souter, who was shot and survived the massacre that killed my father, who worked up the courage to come and engage with our government and exercise our First Amendment rights, we should not feel restricted in our speech by a room full of guns. I'm not gonna tell you that these are bad people sitting here in the maroon t-shirts because I don't believe that they are. 
However, if the argument for allowing guns to be carried in the, in the halls of government by ununiformed people is that they have a CCW permit, so it's all good, just doesn't hold water with me. An angry, disturbed man who legally carried a CCW permit did not like that he was being fired, so he used his gun to murder my father and five other men whose families' lives remain in ruins today. If a disturbed man like the one who murdered my father was able to pass our imperfect background check and flimsy CCW permit check systems, what's to say that an individual with the, a similar type of personal uh, disregard for someone in these halls of government, maybe at a legislator, staff member, or citizen with an opposing opinion or ideology would not uh, let fire here in the halls of government. But please, don't wait for the next tragedy to happen. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> My name is Gary Thompson from St. Paul. Minnesota is one of only seven other states allowing handguns to be carried in its capital, which does not screen for weapons. The other states allowing guns require weapons screening, including the gun-friendly state of Texas. Majority of all states require some form of capital weapons screening, but it might not be with metal detectors. With large expenditures now in capital remodeling, a small amount can be set aside for weapon screening. Every day, murders are committed in our country, and some are with con carry concealed handguns. It appears that Governor Dayton wants to screen for weapons until some incident happens. Would it be something that Homeland Security or the FBI would be called upon afterwards? The rights of Visitors to our beautiful capital are infringed and bring a chilling effect on the right to free speech, especially on attending a hearing when the room is full of armed people who disagree with them. It is unreasonable to force gun violence victims who are already traumatized to face loaded guns when testifying about their experience. There are many other reasons why loaded guns should not be allowed in our museum-like capital, where families and school children come to see and learn. Safety in public buildings is not served by the presence of guns. The Hennepin County Government Center started to screen for guns, but only after a disturbed woman was murdered, murdered one person and wounded another. Why would we wait for something similar to happen in our capital before doing something to prevent handguns in hearing rooms or legislative chambers? As a military veteran, handguns were not allowed on posts and bases when I was in the service. This is still the case, as our Air Force Reserve Station does not allow any concealed carry weapons from active personnel or visitors. I feel that Representative Cornish is a bully, especially after his wet their pants comments. After my testimony last week, I was definitely offended. I believe he is the highest form of hypocritical armed legislator. Oh who chooses to sir, intimidate, sir, real sir, kill, and gonna, harass citizens okay, who disagree sir, with the ideas please, of a wild west. I, I ask you please not to be making comments about others. This kind of behavior has no place where all Minnesotans, <laughs> including school children, can visit and learn our history. Finally, I call on Representative Cornish to apologize to me and the many other citizens, including legislators Sir. like my representative, Michael Paymar, who disagree with his positions on guns. And he should also apologize to the media. Enough. Thank you. Thank you. Ma'am? Yes, my name is Ann Mongovan, and I live in St. Paul. I first came to the Minnesota Capitol on February 5th to support gun violence prevention legislation after hearing Sammy Rachamin speak at my church and learning someone in my church was a grandmother of a student at Sandy Hook. I wanted my support to be visible and by, by my presence at the Capitol. I arrived 10 minutes before the hearing was to start and was directed to the second overflow room. I went into the room and saw many people had buttons or clothing indicating they held different positions different from my own. When the hearing began, instead of the room getting quiet so we could all listen, people started heckling the screen where Representative Paymar was speaking as he opened the hearing. I remember looking at the sticker in my hand saying I was a Minnesotan who didn't want to be shot and deciding I didn't feel safe in the room identifying myself as someone who didn't agree with the people in the room <clears throat> who continued to speak in a hostile and disrespectful manner as the testimony began. 
I started to look around the room to find people I would be comfortable standing near. When I did find someone, she leaned over and said, what really makes me uncomfortable is the fact that so many people who are speaking so rudely come to the Capitol with loaded guns. All of the heckling in that room I <clears throat> that day, I believe, was clearly done with the intent of creating a climate of intimidation and to drown out one side of the discussion. Allowing people with loaded guns into the Capitol doesn't advance the democratic process. It shuts it down. When the state condones this kind of arm bullying, my First Amendment rights of free, of free speech has been violated. Throughout the session, I worked to invite people to the Capitol in support of gun violence prevention legislation. I was always aware that I needed to tell people that there would likely be people in opposition to us who would be carrying loaded guns. This was unknown to most people who assumed the Capitol banned guns like other government buildings where volatile issues are discussed and decided. Toward the end of the session, I had a letter to the editor published in the Pioneer Press and became aware of how wide the network of intimidation is on this issue. I've received rude phone calls at home questioning my position on this issue and scaring my children. <laughs> and propaganda mailed to my home, just letting me know that someone out there knows my home address. I feel less safe participating in our democratic process in Minnesota without a ban on guns at the state capitol. I would also like to see some kind of screening for weapons before people enter the Capitol. I believe the Minnesota legislature and governor have the responsibility to protect the safety of people who want to be involved in the democratic process, the public, the staff, and elected and appointed officials. I urge you to act. Thank you. We have about three minutes left, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Good morning. I am uh, Jim McKee, and I'm a citizen of the United States of America, uh, currently living in Minnesota, and I'm enjoying that life. Uh, I want to say that today I am here at your request, and uh, you have asked for public comment. Uh, uh, chairman, uh, senators, police officers, uh, committee members, uh, First of all, I'd, I'd like to thank the, the officers that put their lives uh, on the line for us uh, each and every day. For those of you that have done that in the past, uh, I want to thank you for, you know, for that service. Uh, for comments, uh, please restrict the thoughts or the, the comments that you hear. Uh, yeah, there are buzzwords out there that try to get people's emotions going one way or another. Um, fear for their lives. Uh, the staff are very afraid, are not too uh, positive in statements in towards uh, uh, finding some sort of resolution. Uh, Representative Ingebrigtsen brought a couple of comments that I'd like to, to make sure that are still there. Uh, I heard it over uh, three or four times. There still is no issue. Uh, I understand that you might be afraid, you know, Representative Paymar. Uh, I don't think you need to be. Uh, Sir, there is I think no you're problem. talking on the other side oh. of the issue. Uh, no, no, no. The, the issue, uh, as I, I think it was stated, was that where is the issue? relating to firearms in the Capitol complex. This relates to, but to you're, I, I do not agree with the use of a firearm or firing of a firearm in the Capitol, okay? Um, the, the comment of what can we expect from those that use or that carry and that have a, a conceal and carry card, I think you can expect that if everybody is nice and if the police do their job, nothing will happen. Uh, there is some professional judgment that is rendered by the, uh, the sheriffs and the police officers and the ex assessment of, a, you know, of us prior to the issuance of a permit. I think that that does and has not been uh, communicated too well 
by the committee. I, I made some of the notes on your comments, and to the committee in general, I would say that, uh, uh, Senator Rest, I think you need to do a little reading. Uh, not much. <laughs> You Sir, don't would have you please just give your testimony? And yeah, you don't I am have taking your testimony from the other side of the issue. You haven't done your homework. Uh, I, I'm asking I would like, for I would like advice, to say that, uh, please. In, in closing, training was, is, was an issue that you brought up, and most of the training continues. There was no... Uh, no, no thought to that. I want you to know that uh, my life changed dramatically when I applied for a permit to carry. It is an awesome responsibility that I do not take lightly. I don't think you should have any fear, any of you, in regards to someone that has a permit to carry. Thank you. Uh, permit to carry persons are not obligated to okay. thank you lastly one thing that uh, as a point of research for you uh, there is a book written by Dr. Rossiter uh, there is a copy in the West St. Paul Library it is titled The Liberal Mind and I think if you read that your life's will be changed. Okay, thank you. I'm going to give you two gentlemen a minute and a half each, okay? Thank yes, you. it's a prepared statement. Thank you very much. My name is Joshua Gruber. I want to underscore first that this advisory committee on capital area security is tasked with reviewing how safety and security can be enhanced or improved. Fundamentally, this discussion and debate is not about, nor should it be about, gun owners' rights. At venues like the airport, that matter is settled. Public safety is the paramount issue, and any gun owner who tries to go through security with a gun will find out that there are limitations on so-called rights. Other rights enshrined in the Constitution also operate within boundaries and certain parameters, including the right of free speech and the right to vote. Context matters, and this is the state capital where legislation that may provoke anger or offend some person or some constituency is the order of business every day that legislation is being deliberated. Security for legislators and the public is a serious matter. It's not a grocery store. Just like when you get on a plane, you can't take a gun into the Hennepin County Government Center either. One of the arguments for keeping the status quo at the Capitol is that a gun ban and a metal, metal detector would be an inconvenience. As a court-appointed guardian and conservator, I appreciate the inconvenience of a two-minute wait at a security check, including a metal detector, when I go to probate court proceedings at the government center. You may recall that the enhanced screening system there was introduced some years back after a conservator was shot and killed, her attorney wounded. Being shot is far more inconvenient than the mild inconvenience caused to anyone in this room who might have to pass through a metal detector. Just as the Hennepin County Government Center is as open as it ever was, the Capitol, too, would be as open as it presently is, except for that small step of going through a detector. There's no chilling effect, if anything, knowing that you can go about your business without the risk of a concealed weapon being misused has a soothing effect. Do we need to wait for a shooting to occur here before more security measures are taken? As the governor himself noted, one incident, quote, one incident would tip the scales enormously. Better to do something now than regret not having acted soon enough. Thank you, Mr. Gerber. <laughs> pastor. Uh, my name is James Erlinson, pastor of Lutheran Church of the Redeemer in St. Paul. I have treasured my right as a citizen of this state to come to my state capitol to testify, witness testimony, and speak freely without fear with my representatives and fellow citizens about laws and policies that are made to benefit all who live in Minnesota. This past legislative session, I was disturbed by one thing, how the presence of firearms infringe on my right as a citizen to speak freely in our state capitol. I attended several hearings on proposed legislation to extend background checks, and at those hearings, many persons clearly displayed their weapons. While I was standing in line before a hearing began, one gun owner approached a Capitol Police officer, opening his vest to show his gun and his concealed weapons permit to the officer. Then having done so, he let it be known to others that he was carrying a concealed weapon, though it was by no means concealed. So my question is, when most other public 
government buildings, airports, courthouses, schools, churches, or shopping malls in Minnesota prohibit firearms, why does our state capital allow such open displays of weapons? If no threat of harm is intended, it is, even if no harm is intended, it is intimidating and threatening to those who do not carry weapons in public places. So what rights do we citizens who are unarmed have to enter our state capitol buildings free from those who are openly carrying weapons in a public place? I believe that we all have the right to be assured of our personal safety from both the accidental or intentional use of a firearm. It is a matter of public safety for the majority of citizens who do not carry weapons in public places. Our statutes and rules addressing firearms on our state capitol complex and grounds should be changed because the personal safety of every person is the highest right of all. Thank you. Thank you. Now, a testimony from the other side. And I want to remind everybody that all of you, please come forward. Um, I want to remind all of you, you can all provide us with written testimony. It will become a part of the record. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Rob Dorr. I'm a permit to carry instructor uh, here for Minnesota, as well as a uh, leader of the Gun Owner Civil Rights Alliance. Um, first off, I did want to clarify a few things, a few uh, items that were uh, not correct in, uh, in the information that was discussed earlier today. Uh, Representative Paymar, your initial uh, inference was correct. We do have the ability, uh, if there's fear of death or great bodily harm for ourselves or another, to use deadly force. Uh, but I believe that Representative Woodward's comments and, uh, and others, uh, it's not that that makes these, this area safer. Um, Gun-free zones offer a target-rich and low-risk uh, environment for people who want to inflict mass harm. So by advertising as a gun-free zone, that is what makes it dangerous. It makes it a target-rich, low-risk zone for somebody who wants to cause harm and inflict damage. Uh, by uh, uh, also the, uh, the BCA notification, um, the BCA maintains the database of permit holders. Uh, there is no restriction in statute that prevents them from cross-referencing that. Uh, if they wanted to va validate the permits, uh, the validity of permits at any time, uh, they certainly could do so as long as it's uh, for uh, legal purposes. There's no restriction on that. Um, We've, all, we've already covered that there is no problem. This is a solution in search of a problem, uh, and the governor uh, does agree with that. I, I'm greatly concerned that uh, we're turning permit holders into second-class citizens by uh, violating their rights. Uh, some of the most shameful moments in our nation's history have been when we have violated civil rights of people based on others' comfort and prejudices. And I would advise against taking actions that would turn us down that kind of a path. Thank you. Thank you. S sir? Madam Chair, committee. My name is Kevin Vick, owner and president of Crucible Arms. I'm certified by Homeland Security in active shooter response and workplace security. I'm also trained in executive protection, behavioral profiling and threat assessment, and I'm licensed by the BCA to teach permit to carry courses. There is an irrational fear driving a few to feel intimidated and potentially threatened by citizens who legally own firearms. There is also a continual effort by some to infringe on the Second Amendment rights of all citizens. Permit holders are required to regularly recertify and pass background checks. They are acutely aware of the significant consequences of failing to carry a firearm responsibly. Studies by Pew Research and the DOJ show gun homicide rates have declined 39 to 49 percent, with total firearm crimes declining 69 percent over the past 20 years. In a legislative environment, including Minnesota, which supported Second Amendment rights and the right to carry. Please understand that potential gun violence would be perpetrated by individuals bent on doing harm not law-abiding uh, citizens and constituents of yours. Some here are profiling people that legally carry, deeming them uniquely threatening. The Department of Homeland Security says profiling an average shooter is no more possible than profiling an average office person. Listen to that. What is consistent in active shootings is criminals do not recognize gun-free zones, and they certainly don't contact and let people know that they are going to be carrying. 
I thank the committee for addressing the serious business of prioritizing security issues facing the Capitol complex and for not profiling and demonizing citizens that legally carry a firearm. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, you're next. Uh, Madam Chairman, uh, members of the committee, uh, my name is Joseph Olson. I'm a professor of law at Hamlin University and I'm president of the Gun Owners Civil Rights Alliance and have been for over 20 years. I'm speaking in that capacity. Uh, Minnesota has allowed those who have gone through a background check, those who are adults, those who have appropriate training, and those who notify the Department of Public Safety to carry firearms in the Capitol for well over 10 years, I think it's almost 20, uh, without any negative instances. So you have your own evidence. The people who carry firearms in the Capitol in accordance with the statute are not a problem. I heard people talk about, oh my God, someone made nasty comments and someone might hold angry political views. Well, excuse me, but both of those are protected by the First Amendment and it doesn't matter whether you have a carry permit or not. Uh, you're allowed to have your political views. One thing that we know about the permit holders because they've passed the background checks is that they don't let their political views and they don't let their comments and they don't let uh, the situation that they're in affect them. They don't have criminal records. They're not perfect, of course. There are people uh, who have had permits uh, who have committed crimes. Uh, there are people in every profession and every walk of life uh, who commit crimes. Uh, I know of legislators who've been involved in DWI instances and domestic violence instances. Uh, no one is perfect. But of the people who have carry permits in Minnesota, they are, have a much lower record of any kind of acting out than any other group. Now, as I said, it works. I will echo the governor's words. Uh, it works. I'm not afraid of people who have permits and have notified the commissioner. What you should be afraid of is the people who don't have permits, uh, the people who have snuck into the Capitol, uh, and the people who have a long history of doing nasty, vicious things. Uh, and changing this law with respect to carry permit holders will not deal with those folks at all. And they are the problem, not us. Thank you. Ma'am. Good morning, Lieutenant Governor and members of the committee. My name is Heather Callio and I represent the National Rifle Association. I'm here today on behalf of our members across the state to voice our strong opposition to any proposal that would restrict permit holders' right to carry a firearm in the Capitol complex. It would be an affront to law-abiding gun owners to enact a policy that insinuates permit holders are dangerous and should fe be feared while visiting the Capitol complex. Such a policy would silence their voices, forcing them to choose between participation in the legislative process and their Second Amendment rights. The National Rifle Association urges this committee to oppose any policy that would restrict the ability of law-abiding permit holders to carry a firearm for self-defense in the Minnesota Capitol area. The NRA suggests this committee send a strong message to Minnesotans that they should not have to choose between security and participation in the legislative process. I thank you for your attention and consideration in this matter and refer you to NRA's written testimony submitted to the committee. Thank you. Sir, go ahead. Madam Chair, members of the committee, uh, I thank you for taking up this important issue, and it is an important issue uh, that needs careful and thoughtful and informed consideration. And to that end, I hope that you will take this responsibility seriously enough to be properly informed on the issues. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, 
We don't have a concealed carry law in Minnesota. Please give us your name, please. Andrew Rothman, Gun Owners Civil Rights Alliance. Okay. We don't have a concealed carry law in Minnesota. We just have a carry law. There has never since 1974, when the law was passed, been a requirement to conceal. Uh, furthermore, permits don't expire any more than your driver's license expires. As long as you keep renewing it, that one permit is constant and consistent, and it's a single status. Uh, just to uh, illuminate something that Senator Ress said, we don't have permits for the weapons that we carry. The permit goes to the person and not to any particular firearm. Uh, to one comment that the major made, uh, yes, uh, the defense of self also extends to defense of others under Minnesota statute 609.065. In the same way that an individual, whether they have a carry permit or not, is authorized to use deadly force to defend themselves, they are authorized to use deadly force to defend another person. Unlike a police officer, however, they're not obligated to do so. So you were very correct in that. What we've found is that permit holders use remarkably good judgment in the use of their firearms. Not perfect judgment, but if you look nationwide at the statistics, a police officer who runs towards trouble is much more likely to shoot the wrong person than a permit holder by orders of magnitude. That's not a ding on the fine work that the police officers do. It's just a reflection of the reality that they live in, that they have to go into ambiguous situations that permit holders like me do our very, very best to avoid. Finally, I did want to address the concerns about feelings of safety. And uh, I believe that people's feelings are important, but not nearly as important as their rights. And when people say that they feel intimidated and that they feel that a situation was hostile and that they feel that their free speech was curtailed, those are feelings. And there are professionals that can help them with those feelings. But the reality is that the permit holders and the gun carriers who came to the hearings were incredibly, remarkably well behaved and that there was absolutely no violence at the Capitol this session from permit holders, nor was there violence from permit holders in any previous session going back into 1974 when the permit law was passed. I hope that the committee will make its recommendations based on facts and not on irrational fears. Thank you. We have time for one more testimony. Okay. My name is David Gross. Um, speaking in my individual capacity, um, I live in Faribault, Minnesota. I am an attorney uh, who practices law and am licensed to do so. Um, I, I prepared some written comments. I don't know if Angela Garrity got them to you, uh, but I brought some copies and we can somehow get it in the record shortly. Um, my general concern besides the details in my written comments are, is that when I looked at the report and I saw the draft legislation that was proposed. There has been no draft legislation proposed. Uh, Appendix C to the report in January? I, I don't know. Oh, not regarding gun guns in the Capitol. Oh, I, I understand, but, okay. but last week, uh, Representative Paymar said the issue concerning security is guns here, and I, and I was struck by the, the referral language and the broad language that I thought was an attempt to do an end run and to outsource the legislature's responsibility for setting gun policy or security policy to the Commissioner of Public Safety. Uh, because in that draft legislation, it said that the Commissioner of Public Sa Safety shall have the final authority regarding public safety and security in the Capitol complex. That so you're creating a czar. No, and that's wonderful, except that it's the legislature's responsibility to set policy. Sir, the legislature adopted that language. Yeah. And it shouldn't involve guns. See, one of the things that struck me last week was, was the discussion uh, of the capital security regulations. And one of them was the oath of office to uh, support, defend, protect the constitutions. And there was another one calling out the Fourth Amendment. Now, we have a recent example 
of uh, the executive branch and law enforcement, security forces, if you will. Um, in the case of Floyd versus New York, City of New York, uh, decided August 12th by federal judge Shira, oh, I can't think of her last name. Um, uh, but there, there was an outsourcing of the Fourth Amendment to the executive branch, to law enforcement, and her 198-page written opinion decided that doing so was a violation of the United States Constitution, specifically the stop and frisk policy, the search policy, the security policies <laughs> established by um, uh, uh, Governor, uh, Governor uh, Mayor Bloomberg uh, to go after guns on the street or anywhere else. Um, and, and, um, and it was held unconstitutional. So just as an example, Representative Paymar, you know, says guns are the issue for security here, and we've had discussion on the feelings portion of it. Um, but you're running headlong into outsourcing the legislature's responsibility to deal with the issue, to set policy, and to guide law enforcement according to the Constitution and the Fourth Amendment. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have had seven testifiers on each side. We've had 15 minutes on each side at this point. So I thank you for your testimony. And I would just like to be really clear that we are an advisory committee only. We make recommendations to the legislature and the executive branch. We cannot enforce or enact anything. It needs to be passed by the legislature, signed into law by the governor before anything can occur. Um, I know that there are people that want to address the committee on issues other than gun legislation, so it is time to hear from the public on other issues at this time. So would you two please take a seat? Rich Neumeister. And is Don Samuel still here? I'm not sure if he was here to address another issue or if you were here for... The, for the gun issue? Okay, I'm, I'm sorry then. Thank you. Rich. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Rich Neumeister. I've been coming to this building for nearly 50 years when I just lived across a few blocks away from here, running through the tunnels, figuring out what were all those big cans of water and, and all that. That was part of the Civil Defense Fallout Shelter Program. And I even got a couple of those fallout shelters. As, as we know, we don't have a lot of those anymore. But one of the big things, capital restoration and with the new Senate building, which you are involved in with and will put input in, is how you design the building. From how one feel, when one looks at it, it does one feel an ability to access the building and then in reality what it is. As many of you know, I've been here a very, very long time and I've seen many things. And I'll give you one example. And this is where I want you to think about this. When the design plans, as the gentleman indicated, are going to be coming towards you. In 1983, when the state office building was remodeled, and where architectural plans were very open to the public, and still are to some extent, I and some others took a look at those. One of the reasons why is that the issue of access, how you design a building, can make a difference about feeling accessibility. Well, there were plans, if you go up at any of those five floors, you would go out currently now, and then you would go out to where the desks are now. At one time, there were plans, basically, generally the public would not be able to get around there. Basically, there was some discussion about have a general lobby area, and then if you wanted to visit your representative or whoever they were going to put in there at that time, you know, reps and other things, you would basically have to wait there, and then someone would have to come and get you. You don't have that free flow of things now. I only illustrate that to you is how issues of access, and I'll give you one other point, and I think the point is made. I don't visit the other city, the big, the big city in what we call Minneapolis. I'm a St. Paul kid most of my life, not from here originally, Minnesota. <clears throat> but one of the things I notice is that if you go to a, St. a Minneapolis city council meeting, 
all the city council people don't come in through the front doors that the public goes into. They come out of their offices in a locked area and then they come behind in a secret passage and then they come down to the front part of the city council chamber. And so what, how do they, they, that is a setup. That is a setup done by purpose, that is set up by discussion. So it's very hard for the public, as it is here in the St. Paul City Council and other places, for when elected officials leave their place or whatever, for that type of engagement. So <clears throat> the points that were made, there are a lot of things dealing with security other than what you've almost spent most of your meeting on. Also the issue is, is public access, perception, and reality to make sure that at least as I begin my 36th year participating fully in the process in January, that that is not lost. And that is not lost when I first entered this building when I was nine years old. And I still remember the governor's reception person. They didn't have all the security. His name was Mr. Grams. And I still remember meeting him. And he went to school with my, my ma's, because my ma lived in the area for years. He was there. And you would go in and say, hello. Would you like to see the governor's office? Sure. Granted, things have changed, but let's make sure that you, other than just me and others, really take a look at those things so that perception and reality are still ingrained with what we really all believe in is public access to the people's house so that people can have an impact on what goes about their lives in this building and the Senate building and those other things. Madam Chair, thank you for the few moments. Thank you. Is there any other business to come before this uh, committee at this time? Is there anything that anybody wishes to address? Well, um, we will be planning other meetings. Um, we do want to talk about cybersecurity, um, and we'll be addressing that in our fourth, was there another issue? In, a, in our fourth uh, quarter, and continuity of government also. Um, but we will also continue to be addressing issues around weapons policy in the Capitol because I don't feel like we have any clear consensus about where to go and or whether there is anything that needs to be done about it or not. So I, I'm seeking your advisement. I encourage the, the public to uh, send us written testimony. Um, Senator Rest, did you have a comment? Okay. Anybody else? Well, thank you. I know that you all work hard. I know that you all take this very seriously, and I appreciate your time. Being a suggestion.